There is a fairly solid consensus that congestion in the capital city is bad, terrible, and really not good. Cycling advocates say that getting more people out of cars and onto bikes would help. Others beg to differ. And maybe that begins to explain why bike lanes, to rip them out or build more of them, is animating a fair bit of debate in this Toronto mayoral by-election. With us now, for some perspective, in Quebec City, Quebec, former Ontario Cabinet Minister Eleanor McMahon, now President and CEO of the Trans-Canada Trail. Back here in our studio, Trevor Townsend, founder of the advocacy nonprofit group Keep Toronto Moving, and Alison Stewart, Director of Advocacy and Public Policy for Cycle Toronto. And it's great to have you two here in our studio. And Madam President, as I like to call you, because once upon a time you were President of the Treasury Board of Cabinet, Eleanor, welcome back to our program again as well. Alison, I want you just to take us off the top here through a handful of pictures that we're going to show to indicate the different styles of bike lanes that there are out there. So, Sheldon, if you would, let's start to bring these pictures up. Alison, just give us, give us a phrase on each one. What are we looking at here? Well, this we're looking at a protected, separated cycle track. So you'll see from the concrete barriers and the flexiposts that it clearly identifies and separates the space between the pedestrians on the sidewalk, the cyclists and people using the bike lane, parking to the left, and then your vehicle traffic. Gotcha. So that is really the gold standard Next for picture, bike lane. Okay, this one. This is another great example of, well, this is an example of a bi-directional uh, cycle track, which is great. It separates, has one lane for both directions of cycling traffic. Cool. And it can be used to great effect. Okay, third picture, please, Sheldon. This is an example of a multi-use trail. This is the city's most popular down on Queen's Key. So you'll see different types of cyclists. You'll also have joggers and other people crossing the lanes. Queen's Key's down on the waterfront for yeah. those who don't know yes, Toronto. It is. Okay, number four here. And this is really these this is not That's not really a bike, bike lane at all. It's more of they're called sharrows. Um, we, they're used for good effect only as wayfaring. So there's a picture of a picture of a bicycle printed on the road, but you're right there with the traffic. Yes, exactly. And the idea is the Sharrow is supposed to communicate to other vehicles on the road to be mindful and give space for right. people on bikes. And here's the last one. What's this? This is an example of a raised cycle track in construction. This, I believe, is on college. And it's really wonderful because it raises the bike lane to the level of the sidewalk. Great. So it's distancing you from the cars. Okay, so that's what we've got going on right now. Now we're going to focus our discuss discussion, most of it, on the capital city of the province, Ontario, because we're in the middle of a mayoralty campaign and this has come up as a big issue. So Eleanor McMahon, let me start with you. How well, in your judgment, has Toronto done when it comes to getting bike lanes put in? I think Toronto's doing very well. Um, you know, better is always possible, Steve. And, um, you know, as someone who started cycling advocacy in, in uh, during um, the previous mayor, mayor, one of our previous mayors, Mayor Ford, uh, I've seen a tremendous amount of change in Toronto over the last 15 years, driven by the increasing number of people who want to ride, driven by some creative public policy and leadership at the political level, whether it's John Tory, who's the mayor that I worked with when I was in cabinet, and funding and public mm -hmm. policy. I had the privilege of being in cabinet, as you mentioned, and as a minister, I led the investment of $125 million in cycling lanes and infrastructure in Ontario. 25 million of that went to the city of Toronto alone. The largest city in the country, that won't surprise you, and finding ways for people to get around safely and effectively was something that Mayor Tory uh, led a council discussion on and, and, and work progressed um, because primarily Good public policy decisions were made, good political decisions were made, there was leadership there, and um, there was a purposeful focus on finding ways to make cycling more mainstream because of all the benefits, including the congestion benefits that cycling brings. Okay, very good. Let me get to Trevor Townsend now. You say you're not against bike lanes, but you may have a different view on how well we're doing. What's your take? Well, listen, uh, we set up Keep Toronto Moving, Steve, uh, not because we're against bike lanes at all, but we just feel that they're not being put in the right places. The reality is, if you look to the 2011, to 2016, and the 2021 census, we have about 1.5% to 2% of identified commuters through the census uh, advising us that they use bike lanes to get to work and back. And so why we're putting bike lanes on some of the 
busiest streets in the city, like Young Street, like the Danforth, like Bloor Street, makes, to me, no sense. It's not good for cyclists, because why would you want to put cyclists on the busiest streets when there are alternative streets that cyclists could use much more safely? Edelson, you want to speak to that? I sure do. Uh, so, like people who drive their cars, the reason that um, there needs to be more bike lanes on busy streets is because those are where all the locations and destinations are. So, what we found, for example, during COVID, one of the reasons why the city implemented Active TO, it was to provide alternative, safe transportation options for essential workers, uh, many healthcare professionals. So, for example, one of the reasons that the university bike lanes were implemented was at the request of doctors and health professionals that needed that safe way to get to it. And so, whereas the success of our car infrastructure, it hinges on the fact that it's interconnected and <laughs> across the city. And so, just as we did when we built our system of automobility and built our roads and streets, we now need to add additional lanes for bikes to make it safer for people walking, taking transit, and biking. Let me put that to Eleanor McMahon. Uh, Eleanor, you heard uh, Trevor say that only 1.5 to 2 percent of people who are commuting are using bike lanes, and that's there's a lot of infrastructure going in to accommodate a relatively small slice of the commuting public. What's your view on that? Two things, Steve. It's chicken and egg. If you build it, they will come. So basing our urban planning around current uh, current measures is is not visionary, and it's not good city building and city planning. It's also not accommodating what people want. I have another survey to put in the window, and it's one that we did at the Share the Road Cycling Coalition, aligned with our Ontario Bike Summit earlier this year, in fact, just in April. And we did a study and we looked at, we did a poll of Ontarians and a couple of important things emerged. First of all, over the last 10 years, the number of people riding daily has gone up fivefold. So now 22% uh, of Ontarians are daily cyclists. That's close to 4 million people who are riding their bike every day, uh, over 3 million people. And that's extraordinary. And those people want and need safe spaces to ride. I think as a society, we have an obligation to find ways for them to ride, to go to places that they want. And it's in our absolute interest to do that because the bicycle that's beside you or in front of you in some cases, ideally beside you, in a protected infrastructure and bike lane is the car that isn't. And more people getting out of their cars more often enhances affordability, enhances people's well-being, enhances economic activity, actually. And if we can find safe and smart ways to do it, as cities around the world are doing, I just got back from the Global Cycling Conference, Velo City in Germany. So I guess I'm inspired by cities all around the world that are doing exactly what Canada is trying to do, and we are making some progress, but more needs to be done. And I would say that since 40% of our trips in Canada are under 10 kilometers, and indeed 30% of them are under two kilometers, most of our daily trips are doable by bicycle, and we can start to think of converting those trips and, and making infrastructure a primary uh, way to invest and so that we can engineer that. Okay, Trevor, I, I see you busily taking notes, so what do you hey, want to listen, respond to uh, that? A couple of things. Alison touched uh, in her answer about convenience. It's not convenient for cyclists, uh, and so they should have access to the major arterial roads to get to shops and businesses. The reality is that we're talking about safety here, and putting cyclists on the busiest streets, arterial roads in this city isn't safe for the cyclists. It isn't safe for commuters in cars uh, who are trying to uh, access, especially at intersections, uh, across these bike lanes. Uh, pedestrians, senior citizens, people with accessibility issues. What I'm hearing from Torontonians, not from other global cities, but people in my neighborhood where I live, is that these bike lists, that, or that these bicycle lanes, especially the dedicated bicycle lanes, are really dangerous. And so I would suggest to you that um, here in Toronto, we did, before we got Keep Toronto Moving, which is the organization I'm with uh, that I set up, before we got this organization established, we went out and did some polling. And the polling, Steve, that we uh, conducted was done through a professional third-party organization. Two out of three Torontonians believe that these bike lanes should not be on our arterial roadways in our city. Where would that, you put them then? Uh, to streets adjacent, which are not as busy, uh, a good example, uh, you know, look at Young Street. We've got hundreds of shops along Young Street. And then if you look over one street to Avenue Road, we have no shops. Uh, and so that's a great example of where one might look as an alternative, uh, safer for cyclists, 
safer for everybody on the road. So you'd take out the, just so I understand, you'd take out the bike lanes that are on Yonge Street at the moment, which is one of the major north-south thoroughfares in the city of Toronto, and you'd move them over to Avenue Road? Well, I mean, I'm not going to do anything. This is up to no, public but officials, but that's recommend. what I would suggest. You asked for an example. Mm -hmm. One thing I'll comment on with these bike lanes, look at Yonge Street. When the subways go down, uh, we have all of our commuters trying to get to North mm -hmm. Toronto stranded, and it happens all the time. It happened, I think, yesterday afternoon, okay. and people are stuck. It's, it's not the right place. And so what we're advocating is that Biking is fantastic. We like biking. In fact, many of our supporters are cyclists. Uh, but what we would suggest to you is that we need to do a rethink here. And the problem with the policy, as I see it right now, is that the City of Toronto Transportation Department, the data that they're using, Steve, to justify these bike lanes is flawed data. It's not data that's... What's wrong with it? Well, a good example on Young Street. Uh, do you know that to justify the bike lanes on Young Street last year, in, the, in 2022, from January 1st to December 31st, the, guess how many days the data that they used was to justify the bike lanes? Sorry, say Eight, again? 18 days of the year they collected data to justify bike lanes. They didn't collect data between uh, November 1st and April 30th, and they didn't collect data from May 1st to, to the end of October, they didn't collect data on days when there was precipitation, and they didn't collect data when the weather was seasonally above what it should be or below what it should okay. be. Okay, let me get Allison in here and, and maybe speak to his point that Young Street has a lot of action on it, a lot of activity on it, a lot of shops on it, and it's perhaps not the best place to take a bike lane out, excuse me, to, it would be a better place to take the bike lanes out and put them more on Avenue Road where there are fewer shops, fewer retailers, and better thoroughfare. That's the argument. Well, as a counter argument, one would say, why do we have vehicular traffic on Young at all? Because you have one of the longest and most important subway systems along Young. Um, having bike lanes are needed on Young because, because of all the shops. So for example, I'm gonna step back to the city's first complete street, um, and that's Bloor West. And it was one of the most studied one and a half kilometers of roadway ever in North America because there was a lot of research and planning that went into piloting what, what would that impact, right? Having a busy main street, um, putting in bike lanes. And what they found was actually, and this across the world studies, business owners overestimate the number of their customers that come to their business by car. And so what we saw with Bloor Street West is just 9% of the people that actually visit the area and spend money are car drivers. And that percent remained the same both before and after the bike okay. lanes were added. Can I tell you what I thought you'd say? What? I thought you were going to say, you can't put bike lanes on, universe, on Avenue Road because people drive 70 and 80 kilometers an hour on Avenue Road and it's too dangerous. Whereas on Young Street, because it's so much traffic, you really can't go any faster than 20 or 30 or 40 kilometers an hour. And that is definitely important. But for example, one of the reasons that, for example, currently biking on an arterial road, and Avenue Road is essentially an arterial road dividing our city in the downtown, if you build safe infrastructure, like some of that safe and protected bikeways, you will make it safer. And also- But, but here's other... what I'm gonna say on that point, if, if, if you will. If I heard the beginning of your answer, you suggested, you were basically suggesting we shouldn't have cars on Young Street. Why do we have cars on Young Street? If that's what I heard you say. And that to me why is not fundamentally- ask that question? Well, that's, if you're asking the question, it's because you want people to think about whether or not we should have cars on Young Street. And so Torontonians have to decide. Cycle Toronto, which is a fantastic organization, and does a lot of good work, Thank you. is advocating that we need to ask ourselves if we should have cars on Young Street. And I will ask you, so if you are retired and you're a senior citizen and you don't have the physical ability to ride a bicycle, if you're disabled and you don't have an ability to ride a bicycle, if you are somebody who uh, has a young family, four children, you're a, sing you're a mother at home and need to get to places, you're advocating that Young Street should not have vehicles for people to, to get through. That's what Torontonians have to decide because that's what Cycle Toronto advocates are pushing. Well, hang and on I think a minute. it's really important. Okay, that's, hang on, I gotta go to Eleanor out of town here. She's been waiting patiently. Go ahead, Eleanor. Yeah, that's, that's not what she said, by the yeah. way. So, oh, so Trevor, let's, let's step back a, a huge bit here. So 
I don't think any of us are advocating that we should get rid of cars. Although I have to say, having come from the Bellow City Global Cycling Conference, where cities around the world, commercially successful cities, by the way, Trevor, that have thriving economies are, are, are removing cars from their downtown spaces. By the way, that's not what we're advocating here. Um, and having been inspired by those examples, Brussels, Paris, who's, and the mayor of Paris has you know, indicated uh, recently that they are spending hundreds of millions of dollars investing in cycling to get people out of their cars and to give them that option. It is a check in the neck thing because if you don't give people the option to take anything else in their car, then that's what they're going to do. Trevor talked a moment ago about how the subway had trouble and it caused traffic congestion. Imagine for those short trips, and I mentioned a little while ago that, you know, 30% uh, of our trips are under two kilometers, 40% of our trips are under 10. Since most of our trips are short, imagine if people had the option to ride their bicycle, to walk, to take transit more extensively, then they would choose that. Then you wouldn't have the kind of congestion that you do. What the I'm idea, advocating, but hang if on, I, if, if I can finish, yeah. please, if I can finish, I have the floor. Thank you. Go ahead. I would appreciate that. What people are telling us through our polling, by the way, when we asked Ontarians, over 50% of them said they would love to cycle more. But you don't see those people on the road now, Trevor. And the reason that you don't is over half of them also said they're too afraid. And the number one reason that's going to get them out of their cars, which is something that most of us want because it helps the economy, it helps our climate, and it helps the public health and well-being and the commercial activity of our cities. Every single study that I have seen around the world shows that including Times Square in New York, when you remove vehicles, the commercial activity escalates dramatically. Because okay, let me get Trevor in here. Okay, Eleanor. so thank you very much. Yeah. People want to stop and shop. Okay. Go ahead, Steve. Go ahead, Trevor. All right, so listen, um, I, I, I can't help but notice that all, a lot of you a lot of what you speak about is in Europe and in other cities around the world. And I just want to, if, if you will, I have the floor. If you will, I have the floor to use your words back to you. Um, what I will suggest to you is that we live in a northern climate, okay, in, in Toronto. And this climate is not Paris. It is not Amsterdam. Look, at, there's absolutely a place for cycles, for cycle lanes in Toronto. It's not on the major arterial roadways. And I will just comment uh, something else that's been brought up, the businesses. If you go and speak to businesses where they where these cycle lanes have been introduced, and there's a there's some um, market research poll that will be coming out within the next couple of weeks, two thirds of the business small business owners. I'm not talking about banks. I'm not talking about government agencies. I'm not speaking about um, uh, about uh, 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 franchises, if you will, where they're not allowed to participate in municipal political questions. But we went to small business owners, over 200 of them on Danforth, on Bloor, and on Young Street. And two-thirds of those business owners today are against having the cycle lanes. Why? Because their sales have dropped dramatically. And so, because of that? And because of the cycle lanes. Because people no longer want to go onto those uh, streets because they're so mired in congestion that they've decided they'll go elsewhere. Let so me get Alice's sales take on down. that. Sales down because of bike lanes in. Well, no. And actually, what we've found and, and studies here in Toronto is that actually sales have increased and that one of the benefits, most of the people that are shopping in those local areas come from transit, from walking and from biking. They visit the area more often and they Can spend I just more money. Do a fact check here. Are, are, were, were sales down because we got COVID and are sales up now because COVID's pretty much over? Okay, so that's what I'm wondering. So, right. the so value then, for of example, all be, so before COVID, when, for example, and I'll, I'll refer back to one of the first really um, studied streets, we're looking at Bloor West and uh, Des and Danforth, mm -hmm. and so they took a look at the two areas. It's the Monera study you're referring to. The yes. Monera study was was done in 2016. But, but I, would like, I would like just to, to take the, a step above, and I understand that. Uh, people get really emotional. Right now, nobody is well served. If you talk to people who rely on driving, if you talk to people who rely on transit, if you talk to people that rely on biking and walking, none of us are well served. And that's because our city has grown exponentially over the past 20 years, and we haven't made the adjustments to our infrastructure. And so, for example, when we talk about bike lanes, it, it, we, we shouldn't just be talking about bike lanes. We're talking about complete streets. We're talking about ways to provide more sustainable, healthy options for that are more accessible to share for the everyone. But, but back onto the businesses, I, 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 no, I, sales are down. Well, I'd actually like to, to mention one of the comments that uh, Trevor made about people with accessibility. So when we talk about people that have 
that face accessibility, disabilities, and mobility challenges, well, one, those people aren't a monolith. As humans, we all experience levels of disability. Um, I know many people that actually are able to get around by biking because it's more accessible to them. And the advent of e-bikes has really increased the ability for people to get around. So whereas the city's transformed TO target of achieving 75% of all trips five kilometers and under through active modes of transportation like biking and walking and taking transit, that is absolutely attainable on an acoustic bike. But, but, but when you but add e-bikes, you are making it even easier. So for people... Okay. But Allison, on, I mean, you're talking about e-bikes. I can't think of a better example of a disaster in the city of Toronto than what we're seeing with e-bikes. I don't know anybody. I don't know cyclists. I don't know can any, anybody out there who feels the e-bikes are well-serving this city. And you know, oh, I, I, I'd like to find a 70-year-old who, who you go out and show me... And this is an aging city, by the way. So we're only getting, people are living longer and those people have a right to get access to businesses. So look, at, if you were to put a cycle lane on adjacent streets, a dedicated cycle lane, a safe dedicated cycle lane, which is a good idea, but put them not on the busiest streets, put them on streets where yes, they might have to jaunt over a block or two to get to the store they want, but you're not creating enormous manufactured congestion. Let me put that to Eleanor. Eleanor, what's wrong with that idea? I just I, I I think it's a point of view, and I'm I'm respectfully disagreeing with Trevor. I, I guess in in every sense of the word, he said that yes, you'll have to jog over a street. Well, 87% of Ontarians are drivers and cyclists. This is us. This is not us versus them. And more of them want to ride more often. So those are the people that that Allison and I are speaking to. Those are the people that we serve. Those are the people that want to ride bikes more often. Those are the people that are shopping. Those are the people that are doing daily trips by bike. Those are the people that want to do more of them by bicycle, who want to cycle around their neighborhood. Again, I go back to my statistics that are Environment Canada statistics. Um, 10, under, um, under 10 kilometers, 40% of Canadian trips. And our daily trips under two kilometers, 30% of them are imminently doable by bicycle. If we make it easy and safe, you know, this has been a hundred years of industrial complex that's created the autocentric city that we have. I know, I grew up in Windsor, my dad was an auto worker, so I'm very familiar, and I'm not anti-car, nor is Allison. This isn't a polarizing conversation, and when we get into public policy conversations about cycling, one of the regrets that I have is we end up being car versus bike. That's not what this should be about. But it, okay, should, be about you? What? it should be about data. It should be about data. And, 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 I, and the data and I, is flawed that's being used to put these bike lanes in. That's the opinion. problem. Hang on a second. You're, that's an opinion that you are allowed to have, but it is a opinion. It is not opinion that I share, nor is an opinion that I, Allison shares. So that's okay. For us to make progress, we have to disagree to agree to disagree on some of these things, but polarizing things but, and not listening to one another is not going to get us there, Trevor. So what but, I but here's, would, but here's the thing I would suggest. That, you, if, what I would suggest I, you is that we need proper data, and the city okay, won't collect on. the data. Hang on, hang on. Hang on a second, Trevor. Hang on a second. We've been respectful, so you know we're all in this together, Trevor. That's the overarching message here, is that. You know, my husband was killed by a, a careless driver on his bicycle. I started an organization to make cycling safer, more convenient, easier. And I rode a wave of increasing cycling around the world in North America, in Canada, in the United States, Trevor. So one of the conversations I had with John Tory early on when we met was he's competing for jobs with Chicago, Los Angeles, Boston, all of these cities, New York City, moving towards a more bicycle-friendly landscape because the next generation, Trevor, is not driving. The current generation we need to think about. Elderly Canadians we need to think about 100%. And by the way, those are the fastest growing consumers of e-bikes are elderly people. So, and you know, that's, that's global. So I'm convinced, Steve, that despite sometimes polarizing points of view, that we can get there together if we think about what kind of city do we want and if we're creative and thoughtful and yes, if we continue to use evidence to guide us and I think that's important too. Let me try this with you, Trevor, if I yeah. can. And that is that we know this city is growing exponentially, right? Yeah. The immigration targets across Canada and we know of, in a couple of years time when half a million people come here, we know that a lot, you know, I don't know about the majority, but a huge chunk of them are gonna settle here in Toronto. They can't all drive. Nope. There's not enough room on the roads for everyone to drive. Would you, would you agree that we need to do a pretty major uptake in bike infrastructure in order to give people more options so we don't have more cars on the road? 
Well, listen, uh, the city has allocated almost a quarter of a billion dollars towards bike infrastructure. Uh, in the next 10 years, uh, I think next eight years, there's another uh, 180 million still to go. I think they've sent about 60 million so far. Uh, and they've made great progress. But the question I think you have to ask yourself is how and where we put these bike lanes is the issue. And the data that the City of Toronto's Transportation Department has collected is flawed. And the data that is being used to justify these bike lanes is not correct data. That, uh, you need to, we need to go out there and gather the proper data. We need decisions made on, rational, on a rational data basis. And that's not what we're seeing right now. Allison. Well, one, I would like to say and really applaud the city staff at Transportation Services have done an amazing job collecting and analyzing data. But one of the programs I'd really like to draw everyone's attention on because it's providing data and demonstrates that there's a latent demand for people discovering bikes, partly in thanks to active TO, um, rapid TO, cafe TO, reasons to get out and rediscover their spaces, and that's Bike Share Toronto. Bike Share Toronto has grown over 300% since 2017. Just take a second, tell us what that is. Okay, so for people who aren't aware of it, it is a publicly run program by the Toronto Parking Authority, and it provides access to bikes to help extend transit user, users' trips. Is that what they're doing? That is exactly what these people are doing. The, the, it's affordable, it's accessible, um, and it, it demonstrates, they've discovered that even where they have stations where that aren't supported with safe cycling infrastructure, people are using them. Mm. And so, for example, thanks to Bike Share, we now know, for those that don't think that cycling in Toronto is a year-round activity, I myself am a year-round cyclist, Bike Share, last, late October, they had more users than they did in August of the year before. So it's growing. It's growing. But, but on we're, that, we're down to our last 30 seconds, I'll give it to you. Yeah, Go ahead. sure. 1.4% of Torontonians uh, commute to work with bicycles. Those aren't my numbers. That's Stats Canada. And those were the numbers in 2011, in 2016, and 2021. So when we talk about build infrastructure and they shall come, so far in our own backyard here in Toronto, it hasn't happened. It's, and so we have to ask ourselves where best to put bike lanes where we can all coexist together. And I would suggest you on our busiest, most congested streets in this city isn't the right place to start. And it's a is, reasonable balance position. That is the last word on this program. Forgive me, we're out of time, everybody. But I want to thank all three of you for having a real good sparky debate here on TVO tonight. <laughs> Eleanor McMahon in Quebec City, Trevor Townsend, Allison Stewart. Thanks to the three of you. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome thank conversation. You. Thank you so much. Take care. <laughs> The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.